So I'm going to talk to you about somebody who's been a massive influence on me, um, even long before I met this incredible man. And I'm talking about Air Vice Marshal James Edgar Johnny Johnson, who was ultimately the RAF's officially top-scoring fighter pilot of World War II, or the Second World War, actually, as we should more accurately call it. But I first became aware of Johnny, like countless other schoolboys in the 1960s, when Airfix released the 172nd scale model of his famous Mark 9 EN398 that's actually the most successful combat Spitfire of all time. Um, and I must have made countless models of this over the years. It wasn't actually a very good model, but it was what it was back in the day. Um, but wonderful. And this, this artwork with, with Johnny, the wing leader of the Canadians at Kenley, with his personal initials, James Edgar Johnson, which was a wing leader's prerogative. Uh, and it always stayed with me, this image. And then, of course, we... Um, that there are the comics and Johnny's stories featured on the, the cover of a lot of these comics and things and so on. Um, and his wonderful book, his own memoir, with, uh, it's just fantastic, Wing Leader. And uh, Johnny wrote up, Johnny was actually a highly intelligent individual, very, very well read. And... Um, uh, a really gifted descriptive writer. Uh, if you haven't read Wing Leader, get it. I mean, you can still get it's published, republished, published, republished, published repetitively. Uh, so it's readily available on, on the usual online outlets and elsewhere. So, um, Wing Leader, fantastic. And it was just inspirational reading this stuff, uh, particularly. One passage where Johnny talks about a low-level attack on uh, a German airfield in France, which is absolutely one of the best bits of descriptive writing I think you could ever read. Uh, absolutely superb. Uh, and certainly uh, comparable to Jeff Wellham's description of being uh, hacked apart a bit by an ME109 during the Battle of Britain in his memoir, First Light, that was published much more recently. So Wing Leader, huge inspiration to us all, backed up by good old Airfix. But let's have a look at, uh, let's have a look at the man. What I'm going to do, similar to what I'm doing with Douglas Bader, I think that Johnny's story uh, is so important and it, it mirrors and runs concurrently with, with so much history of the Royal Air Force during the Second World War and post-war because of Johnny's post-war career uh, and, uh, and his gregarious and sociable uh, approach to engaging with like-minded fellow enthusiasts, which was absolutely amazing. So there's a lot to talk about, Johnny, and this is just to introduce the man to you. Um, now... So Johnny is from relatively ordinary beginnings. He is born at Barrow-upon-Saw uh, in Leicestershire on the 9th of March 1915. He's the eldest of two boys. He had a younger brother called Ross. Uh, uh, his father, Alfred, was ultimately a police inspector in the Leicestershire Constabulary. His mother, Beatrice, this is Johnny. Uh, as a very young boy in a bit of a sailor suit going on there. I don't know what that's all about. Um, but a great influence on Johnny's life was his uncle, his maternal uncle, Charlie Russell, who won a military cross in the First World War. Uh, and Uncle Charlie regaled uh, young Johnny with his tales of daring do and so on and went off to Malaya uh, and made a fortune. And he sponsored Johnny to... Um, Loughborough Grammar School uh, and in this picture this is Johnny behind and Ross uh, riding donkeys on the beach somewhere Skeggy probably and um, Ross did say to me you know the remarkable thing about that photo is that Johnny is behind because Johnny was always the leader he was a natural leader absolutely gifted leader and this is Johnny uh, playing football for Loughborough Grammar School, which, as I say, his uncle Charlie sponsored him through school 
So that got him to university to read for a degree in civil engineering. Uh, now Johnny was in the Leicestershire Yeomanry, which was horses basically, and he used to tell a fantastic tale. I mean, this is a man with, with a, a, an absolute charisma and enthusiasm overload that Johnny could just walk into a room and just fill it with his presence. is absolutely remarkable. Uh, and as a speaker, he was unparalleled. I mean, Johnny could hold an audience. Uh, it, was, it, it was just fantastic knowing him the way that I did uh, and learning so much from him. And Johnny was fascinated as well by leadership. And, I, and he had the gift, no question about it at all. We're going to really talk about these things uh, in lots of different films as things go on. But Johnny's uh, in the Leicestershire Yeomanry and one day a couple of Spitfires flies over and he thinks, well... I think that's where I need to be, not sat on the back of this old nag. So he applies for the Auxiliary Air Force, which is the uh, the, the, the socio-economic elite, really. And um, Johnny goes along for his interview, and the interviewing officer says, uh, I see you're from Leicestershire, Johnson, with whom do you hunt? And Johnny says, well, I don't hunt, sir, I shoot. I shoot game, birds on the wing. Well, thank you, Johnson, that will be all. Because clearly, he wasn't a member of the local hunt, so therefore, Johnny Johnson had not the social background to join the Auxiliary Air Force. So Johnny went off, undeterred, and joined the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve. So the Volunteer Reserve is a different setup. The Auxiliary Air Force is based on the territorial principles. So these are specific squadrons raised locally and in time of war can be called to full-time service. Now the VR situation is slightly different because this is based on the citizen volunteer principle, so people remain embedded in their civilian jobs, uh, studying ground, ground school subjects in weekday evenings, and then learning to fly uh, at the weekend at the RAF's expense, usually at civilian flying schools. So that they're, they're still out there, embedded in the community, and when, uh, in time of crisis, they can be mobilised and called to the colours. Uh, and that's exactly what happened in uh, late August, early September 1939. So Johnny is mobilised, uh, and, and all air crew, minimum rank of sergeant, which caused some problems at the time, because it took years in the peacetime air, air force to achieve the, this exalted rank, but... This is Johnny now uh, arriving at Cambridge in initial training wing to do the square bashing before going on to advanced flying training. Uh, and there, Johnny, this gregarious, sociable character, absolutely loved it. He loved the camaraderie uh, of his compatriots, and he really did. And there's one or two interesting people in this line. This is Peter Fox, who I knew extremely well who was a 19-year-old hurricane pilot in the Battle of Britain, shot down and bailed out on the 30th of September over Dorset, survived. Uh, and Bob Poulton, who went on to fly Spitfires in Sailor Milan's uh, 74 Squadron, uh, and knew him very well. So Johnny absolutely loves all this. He thrives on it, absolutely thrives on this. This being with, with other like-minded, fit, intelligent, aviation-mad young men, um, really, it's absolutely his world, totally. Uh, and here's Johnny absolutely beaming. This, this is absolutely, you know, the best thing. Uh, and here's Johnny, advanced flying training now with the Fairy Battle uh, light bomber behind there. And uh, th this is, this is going to be Johnny's world. Johnny is going to become uh, a fighter pilot. So um, there are... A number of facets to Johnny's story, as I explained. So we're going to cut this one here, um, except to look at a few publications that Johnny was involved with. And in future films, we'll be talking about his Battle of Britain, or lack of it, which is an interesting subject in itself. Then we'll talk about his time under the tutelage of Douglas Bader down at Tangmere, the Tangmere Wing in 1941, when Johnny started to, to rise as an ace 
Then we go on to his command of 610 Squadron and uh, subsequently the Canadians at Kenley and then the other wings that he led during the long trek, the great adventure as Johnny always called it, from Normandy uh, in, through into Germany and the end of the war. So fa it's absolutely fascinating subject and, and especially around Johnny's take on leadership. Uh, which is really, I don't know anybody who had the gift like this or knew as much about leadership as Johnny because he'd studied it in real detail. So, as I explained before, Johnny um, was a, a really gifted writer himself and, and he co-wrote this with another fighter ace, Laddie Lucas, who was Douglas Bardi's brother-in-law and a long-time member of Parliament. Um, and it, it's a special book to me because um, Johnny... Um, Johnny signed it to me, of course, did it, all good wishes, 16th of uh, January 1998. Uh, and we were, um, we spent a lot of time together, Johnny and I, in his man cave, recording conversations and Johnny's memories of back in the day. And we were actually going to do a book called um, Johnny's Kenley Spitfires, which was a follow-on to my Bardis Tangmere Spitfires and Bardis Duxford Fighters. But uh, sadly, Johnny left us in January 2001. Um, so the books never got written. But ultimately, I produced, I, I did produce them uh, in in two volumes, the the Top Gun books. Uh, these books are what they were really. It was all a bit cottage industry uh, in those days, and we didn't have the publishing technology that we've got today. Um, so they came out, but there was supposed to be a third one, and I didn't write it until I, I, I finished it off under the Spitfire Ace of Aces uh, title with Amberley Publishing about ten years ago, uh, and it's available in paperback under the, the same title, this one. But what I'm doing at the moment is uh, Chris Johnson, Johnny's youngest son, who's a great friend of mine, um, Chris very kindly gave me the copyright to Johnny's 1942 diary so we're bringing that out shortly and it's an incredible document and we'll do a specific film about that because this is such an important historic text uh, and his great adventure which is his last look back as a as grey cap leader um, and, and is really uh, we don't know whether Johnny finished the book or whether there was any more to come so it's quite an intriguing uh, manuscript uh, from that point alone and both of those books being published by Pen and Sword later this year before Christmas and then in March next year Johnny's photo album of over 300 photos and these are really amazing pictures so you know Johnny I, I'm absolutely on a mission to maintain the currency of Johnny's story and the inspiration of Johnny's memory and for people to know about him because he was just amazing and uh, We'll really get into this. We're going to be getting into Douglas Bader in detail in lots of different films, and the same with Johnny. And we'll also do the same with Sailor Milan, whose biography I've recently finished. And that that's another absolutely incredible individual and an incredible story. So we've got so much material to work with and so much material to work through. And I hope you enjoy watching these films, which are just a great opportunity for me to, to share my passion with people because that's what it is. I, I, I dedicated my life to raising awareness of these fantastic people and their amazing stories. So um, I, hope, I hope you enjoy watching about Johnny Johnson and reading about Johnny Johnson and remembering Johnny Johnson with me. Thank you.